Welcome back to Your Health radio and television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so pleased you could stay with us. For our third and final uh, segment of the edition today of Your Health, I would like to talk about visual field obstruction. Visual field obstruction is a very common phenomena that involves one or, or more of the structures surrounding the globe or eyeball that falls out of position or overgrows and tends to interfere with a person's full field of vision. Again, that's called visual field obstruction. Now, before I get started to talk about the components that cause this mechanical obstruction of vision, um, I want to emphasize that there are other reasons why a person's vision can be obstructed. There can be a problem with the retina, there can be a problem with the optic nerve or a growth in the eyeball or a problem with the cornea. And of course, as a plastic surgeon, I do not treat those conditions. And of course, a person with that type of vision problem or field obstruction needs to be evaluated and treated by their eye doctor, ophthalmologist, or perhaps screened by an optometrist and then referred to the ophthalmologist. But what I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes are, is the uh, or surgical correction of visual field obstruction involving the eyebrows and forehead or the eyelid or the position of the eyelid. Now, there are many causes of visual field obstruction. And when I see a patient in the office who is concerned whether or not they may have a visual field obstruction, I start at the top. I first look at the position of the eyebrows. Some people's eyebrows can get so large or dependent or descend to the point where, whereby the eyebrows themselves interfere with their vision. Now, um, it's typically um, found in older men. It can also be found in older women. And that's when the forehead and the eyebrow itself can get low enough, affected by gravity, and of course, also by some neurologic problems or neurologic conditions, where the eyebrow itself descends to the point where it interferes with the amount of light coming into the eyeball, into the pupil, or actually certain structures can be obstructed or interfered with. So I start by looking at the forehead and the eyebrow. Now as time permits, I'll go back and address how we surgically correct this. But first, I'd like to talk about the evaluation of a person who is concerned about visual field obstruction. So number one, I look at the forehead and position of the eyebrows. The normal anatomy of the eyebrow will sit at or slightly above or, or sometimes just slightly below the orbital rim. The orbital rim is the bony prominence that you can feel. That's really the superior or cranial aspect of what some people call the eye socket. Of course, the globe or the eyeball is a very well-guarded structure by multiple bones, and the very top part or superior or cranial aspect is called the superior orbital rim. And that bone can guard uh, the eyeball itself, and it also marks the approximate position of the eyebrow. And aesthetically, or from a cosmetic point of view, we like to see a woman's eyebrow above that orbital rim. Um, and for a man, it, it should sit above or just at the orbital rim or sometimes just slightly below. But as I said, when the eyebrow gets low enough, it can actually interfere with someone's vision and it can interfere with the amount of light coming into the eye. Next, I look at the eyelid itself. Redundant eyelid skin is very common with age, especially with people who have been in the sun. And there's a, there's a medical term for that called dermatochalasia. Essentially, that means redundant or markedly redundant eyelid skin. Of course, we need enough eyelid skin to be able to close the eye. Sometimes people will come into the office and they'll look at me or look in the mirror with an open eye, open eyelid, and say to me, see, I have so much extra eyelid skin. However, I will ask that person to close their eyes or let the eyelid down, and I'll take a picture and show them that they need that so-called extra skin to fully close the eyelid. I compare this to the Venetian blind that we all have or all have seen uh, in front of windows. When the Venetian blind is pulled up and folded to let the light in through the window, it appears that there's lots of extra Venetian blind. But of course, when the blind is let down and comes to the bottom of the window, it's usually just perfect and there's not any extra Venetian blind. The eyelid is very similar. 
some redundant skin, some, some folds of skin for the eyelid or some extra skin is normal and actually needed. And if we don't have that extra skin, people have trouble closing their eyes. But too much extra skin is called dermatochalasia. There's a surgical condition or medical condition called lash ptosis. Again, that's lash ptosis, where the eyelid skin is so redundant, so loose, and there's so much extra skin that the skin of the eyelid actually rests on the eyelashes themselves. themselves. And that, of course, is called lash ptosis. Now, there's a, a more profound condition where the redundant skin of the eyelid can go beyond that and actually start to fold, fall down and roll around uh, the eyelashes. And of course, that clearly is visual field obstruction. At certain times, just the eyelid resting on the eyelash can be visual field obstruction. And I'll talk about that a little more uh, later if we have time. Um, but again, dermatochalasia is redundant eyelid skin. When the skin rests upon the eyelash itself, it's called lash ptosis. And either of those conditions can lead to uh, visual field obstruction. And as I said, um, even more redundant skin will result in the eyelid falling over or wrapping around the eyelash itself. That's called lash ptosis. Now there's another important term for us to talk about and that's true eyelid ptosis. Of course, as most of you know, the light needs to come in through the pupil. That's the very dark part, uh, the central part, the circular part of the eye where light comes in and the cornea is in front of that and the lens is in back of that. Of course, the, the light has to come in or the image has to come in and then it's focused uh, on the retina. The eyelid in a resting or forward gaze position has to be at a sufficient level so the entire field, the entire field of vision can come in through the pupil. If the position of the eyelid rests at a, at a point where it's interfering with the field of vision, that's called eyelid ptosis or true ptosis. And of course, that's also visual field obstruction. Ptosis or true eyelid ptosis has many causes. It can be congenital. Babies can actually be born with an inability to elevate the eyelids. Usually there's a lack of um, neurotization, neurotization or nerve input uh, to the levator muscle, the muscle that lifts the eyelid, or there can be a stricture, or there can be an absence or a problem or fibrosis of that muscle itself. That's called a levator. Um, a, Entirely different muscle is responsible for elevating the eyelid as closing the eyelid. The muscle that closes the eyelid is called the orbicularis oculi. It's from a Latin for the orbital mus uh, or, or muscle shaped like an orbit. There's an orbicularis oculi around the eyelid or around the eye. There's orbicularis oris, which is the muscle around the mouth. Uh, the, the word orbit or to encircle has the same root in Latin, orbicularis oris or orbicularis oculi. That's the muscle that closes the eyelids. The muscle, as I said, that opens the eyelid for the main part is called a levator uh, muscle that's deeper in the eyelid itself. There's another muscle called the Mueller's muscle, which is on the inner aspect, on just under the lining of the eyelid, that can also maintain a position of the eyelid but primarily it's the levator muscle that will lift the eyelid. So when there's a problem with the elevation of the eyelid and the level of the lid itself sits at a position where images or light coming into the pupil are obstructed, that's called true eyelid ptosis or true ptosis. That needs to be distinguished from lash ptosis where the eyelid skin is redundant and loose and it sits upon the eyelashes. Sometimes um, when a person is experiencing the symptoms of lash ptosis, they may not have profound visual field obstruction, but they do tend to have a feeling that their eyes are tired or they have easily fatigability. Towards the end of the day, they may feel that they have a difficult time keeping their eyelids open, or they just feel that they, they might feel an ill-defined pressure or fatigue around the eyes or the orbits. That's because uh, the muscle, the levator that is designed to lift up 
the position of the eyelid itself is not really designed to lift up that redundant skin that is resting upon the lashes. And so it can give a person a, a feeling of easy fatigability or tired eyes. And as I said, some people can actually get to the point where they feel they have difficulty opening their eyelids, especially at the end of the day. So once again, if a person is concerned about uh, visual field obstruction, I first look at the position of the eyebrows uh, and the forehead. And I talked about that we desire that the level of the eyebrow will be just slightly above or at the orbital rim or just below. But it, when it descends, it can actually interfere with a person's vision. Next, I look at the eyelid skin itself. Dermatochalasia can result in lash ptosis. That's when the eyelid skin rests upon the eyelash itself. And then when the eyelid itself is sitting or resting at a position that interferes with images or the amount of light coming into the pupil, that's called true eyelid ptosis. And all those come under a category of uh, visual field obstruction. Now, what do we do about it? Well, very briefly, if a baby has congenital ptosis, uh, we, need to, we need to find out if there is a problem with neurotization, if the nerve is, working not, is, is improperly working, um, is the levator fibrotic or absent, is there a stricture, there's something called a phimosis with the eyelid, sometimes the skin is tight or tethered. If that's the case, usually uh, what we can do is called a sling procedure. We take some fascia, uh, from the thigh or a tendon from the wrist or sometimes now a silastic rod or a silastic strip and we actually will tether or connect the edge of the eyelid to the working muscle in the forehead. As I said, a different muscle will close the eyelid as open the eyelid and a different muscle will elevate the eyebrows. That's called a frontalis muscle. So typically in those babies, the frontalis muscle is working and so we'll will take kind of a, uh, a shim or connecting piece of tendon or fascia or even silastic to connect the tarsal plate, which is a cartilaginous structure within the eyelid, will connect it to the muscle in the forehead. And the baby will learn as the baby lifts the, the f eyebrows themselves, as the baby raises the forehead, the eyelids will actually raise. Now in an adult, there's different approaches to true ptosis depending upon what the cause is. Uh, there can be a neurologic problem. Uh, sometimes that muscle called the levator can tear off or weaken or partly tear off. And if that's the case, we actually can go in surgically through an incision in the lid, through the anterior approach, what I typically do, and reconnect or shore up or strengthen that muscle attachment. Again, we try to reattach it to what's called a tarsal plate. That's a piece of cartilage that's in the eyelid. If a person has lash ptosis or dermatochalasia or so much redundant eyelid skin that it's interfering with vision, then of course we can do what's called an upper blepharoplasty. That's when we remove much or all of that redundant skin that's interfering with the vision, the skin that's resting on the lashes causing, causing lash ptosis, and we can surgically remove it. That's an upper blepharoplasty. At the same time, Sometimes we uh, can improve the appearance of the eyelid by sculpting or tailoring the pseudo-herniated fat compartments at the same time, but that's actually an aesthetic procedure that we can dis discuss at a different time. So to address the redundant skin of der dermatochalasia ca causing lash ptosis or visual field obstruction, that's an upper blepharoplasty. If it's the eyebrows themselves, we can do a brow lift. We can lift the lateral brow uh, by making an incision up in the hair we can do an endoscopic approach by making small incisions in the scalp and using an endoscope, which is a modified small telescope fiber optic device to go down and actually rearrange and suspend muscles just under the eyebrow, suspend them up towards the scalp to relieve that visual field obstruction and get the eyebrow out of the way. There's another approach for people, particularly men who have deep forehead creases. That's called a direct brow approach where we can actually excise skin and of course, even though I'm a plastic surgeon, that always leaves a permanent visible scar. But what we try to do is to disguise the scar and lay it into one of the forehead creases and at the same time elevate the brow. So again, there are many causes to visual field obstruction. There can be the eyebrow, the eyelid, or the, or the position of the lid itself. And of course, what we need to do is do a careful preoperative exam 
and custom designed a surgical approach to correct visual field obstruction. It's one of my favorite operations, one of my favorite conditions that I see in the office. And that's all the time we have today for your health radio and television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you tune in again.